the soldiers of the First Army stood at the city gates, welcoming their King Roland. The battle had raged on from yesterday and only ended early morning. After breaching the gates, the First Army took control of the inner city's royal palace and the Grand Cathedral in the Eastern District. What followed was mopping up the remnants of the enemy, utterly extinguishing the resistance forces of Timothy. Brian, with palpable excitement, reported, Your Majesty, the path to the palace has been cleared. The city is now yours. Roland glanced around and saw the same fervor mirrored on everyone's faces. Whether it was the soldiers of the First Army or the witches, their high spirits seemed almost overwhelming. However, contrary to expectations, Roland felt surprisingly calm. The magnificent capital representing the heart of Grey Castle did not resonate with him, nor did he feel like he had returned home. To Roland, this was just another city. All around the inner city were the sites of damaged buildings. Undoubtedly, this was the process of seizing the palace, although brief, was the most intense battle the First Army had ever encountered. Looking at the ruins lining the streets, a pang of distress hit Roland. The exact casualties had yet to be tallied, but the bodies of over 20 soldiers from the First Army had already been sent to the rear. This number would have been at least tripled if not for the timely rescue efforts of Nanoa. As they entered the palace grounds, the station soldiers went down on one knee, a rare sight in the First Army, where military salutes were more common. Roland did not voice any objections. From their uplifted expressions, it was clear that they weren't welcoming him as leader of the army but were paying respects as citizens of Grey Castle to their new king. The soldiers raised their weapons in unison, shouting, Long life King Roland! Amidst the cheers of the First Army, Roland advanced towards the palace. Stepping into the Grand Twin-Towered Palace. This place symbolized the supreme authority of the Grey Castle royal family. Within the Grand Hall, apart from the soldiers holding their weapons at the ready, there was a group of visibly anxious nobles and ministers. Upon seeing Roland, they all knelt in unison, collectively welcoming his arrival. Among these nobles, he recognized several familiar faces, the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Minister of Justice, the Chief of Intelligence Officer, and the Prime Minister, among others. These individuals had once served King Wimbledon III. Some of their lineages could even be traced back to the very inception of the Wimbledon dynasty. When Timothy ascended the throne, they had all pledged their loyalty to the new king. Now, they seemed ready to do the same for Roland, in keeping with tradition. Unfortunately, Roland didn't need any of them. This wasn't a court discussion, it was a trial. Roland took his place on the throne, looking down upon them all. He motioned for them to rise. He then announced that Timothy was under arrest for the suspected assassination of Prince Gerald, for treason, and for colluding with the church. His crimes would be announced throughout the city and the entire kingdom. He then asked the ministers if they had anything to say. One of the nobles was the first to respond, stating that such crimes were unforgivable. He claimed to have once tried to dissuade Timothy but to no avail. The other nobles nodded in agreement. Roland sneered and asked, is that truly the case? When Timothy was committing such heinous acts, was he merely a bystander, or was he aiding his tyranny? Another older minister spoke up, after Timothy ascended to the throne, he promoted a large number of his loyalists. Whether it was deploying the knights or conscripting troops, it was beyond their control from the old ministers like them. Several other nobles and ministers chimed in, adding that when Gerald was sent to the guillotine, it bypassed the judicial court, and the executioners were the knights, they were powerless to stop them. Roland's opinion of these ministers dipped even further. Perhaps during the founding of Grey Castle, these noble ministers were indeed the king's valuable aides. However, over the centuries, they had become utterly rigid and corrupt. Standing up, Roland declared, if they claimed that all the events of the past year had nothing to do with them, then they should play a game. The gathered nobles exchanged puzzled glances, not understanding Roland's intentions. Roland swept his gaze over the gathered nobility, introducing a game called Question and Answer also known as the Trial Game. The rule was simple, tell a lie, and they're out. 
Roland told everyone that each person only gets one chance. The crowd swallowed nervously, before anyone could utter another word, Roland casually mentioned that those who were out could face punishment such as the gallows, labor in the mines, confiscation of their assets, or exile. The ministers started to panic, with some even accusing Roland of treating this as some childish game. A few even thought of leaving. But Roland wasn't seeking their opinions. He approached Duke Wick and asked if he had participated when Timothy had forced the refugees to attack the Western territories. The Duke Wick, after a brief moment of silence and lowering his head, admitted he had followed Timothy's orders to recruit refugees from the eastern and southern regions. However, he claimed unaware of the latter half of Roland's statement. Roland felt a slight pinch on his right shoulder, a sign of lying. He coldly gazed at the Duke Wick stated that he was lying. Even as Duke Wick tried to correct himself, two soldiers from the First Army had already dragged him away. The hall fell silent, with no one daring to speak. Roland hoped for honesty, for he could discern lies. Hearing this, the ministers and nobles fell to their knees, confessing their sins and begging for Roland's mercy. As Roland had anticipated, this was a trial. He posed many questions, and by the end, the ministers and nobles had confessed their crimes and sins from the past year. One noble even confessed that his steward had slept with his wife while he was away hunting, and in retaliation, he had the steward castrated without a formal trial. Roland was momentarily taken aback, thinking, what kind of confessions are these? In the end, some were imprisoned, and others were let go. Roland stood and instructed everyone to leave for now. He would begin the process of restructuring the family order and would notify them later. But he warned them, this game would not be a one-time event. After spending an entire day addressing those issues, it was time to meet Timothy. Axe and Nightingale accompanied Roland as they headed to the basement dungeon where Timothy was confined. As they approached Timothy's cell, it was evident that he was not in the best mental state. However, the moment he saw Roland, he asked, who are you really? His parched voice echoed throughout the dungeon, revealing a mixture of clear, discernible emotions. Roland wasn't surprised by the question. Compared to Tilly, with whom he had limited interactions, Timothy was more familiar with the fourth prince. After all, the fourth prince's erratic and volatile personality was, to a significant extent, a direct result of Timothy's own actions. Roland looked at Timothy and calmly replied, he is Roland Wimbledon. Don't Timothy recognize him? Timothy responded shakily, this is not Roland. Roland could never look straight in the eye at him. Roland would never dare to confront him directly. Roland shook his head, recounting an incident from their childhood when he was 12. Timothy, along with Gerald and Garcia, had invited Roland to explore the palace basement. They then stole a key from a guard and locked Roland in one of these cells. The plan was to come back the next morning to laugh at his misfortune, leaving afterward in a fit of laughter. In that pitch black room, the young fourth prince was so terrified that he shivered uncontrollably, not even daring to shout out loud. In the end, he curled up in a corner, burying his head in his knees, sobbing softly. By the time the trio came to mock him the next morning, his face was smeared with tears and snot. Back then, he didn't even have the courage to face Timothy head-on. The two of them stared at each other in silence for a long time until Timothy, unable to bear it any longer, finally spoke, breaking the silence. Roland is a demon, a demon who has taken Roland's body to steal his kingdom. Roland didn't bother to explain himself. Instead, he retorted, are the deeds Timothy committed any less demonic than those of a demon? Killing their own father, pinning the conspiracy on their brother, and then executing him. To hold on to the throne Timothy seized, Timothy not only allied with the church, which their father despised, but also forcibly conscripted innocent civilians to attack the Garcia's territory. Even the most weakest and inept fourth prince wasn't spared by Timothy. Within just a year, the kingdom is in shambles, with numerous cities ruined by war and refugees scattered everywhere. Perhaps even a demon couldn't have achieved such chaos. Timothy, in a state of panic, tried to defend himself, yelling that he didn't kill their father. 
saying their father committed suicide. Just like Roland, their father was possessed by a demon. Upon hearing this, Roland furrowed his brow. Timothy, gripping the iron bars tightly, insisted he was not lying. Their father was lying in bed as he usually did, and then he just smiled before stabbing himself with a dagger. At that very moment, their father was also wearing the stone of God punishment. Everything unfolded so suddenly that Timothy was powerless to stop it. Roland glanced back at Nightingale, who gave a subtle nod in affirmation. Timothy was telling the truth. This made Roland consider the possibility of an enchanted type of witch. Once their power is fully activated, they remain unaffected by the stone of God punishment. Could this have been the work of the pure ones? Or perhaps the church had orchestrated everything from the very start. The fight for the thrones, which appeared solely designed to incite conflict within the kingdom, now seemed plausible. Yet, Roland lacked concrete proof. For answers, only the high priest of the royal cathedral would need to be questioned. Roland spoke gravely, this is not a reason for Timothy to betray Gerald and spread the flames of war throughout the kingdom. Colluding with the church and using the church's pill to sow death and make innocent people lose their lives. Timothy, retorted, even if he didn't use them, what about Garcia? If everyone had recognized him as king from the beginning, none of this would have happened. Timothy crawled to the railing, gripping the iron bars tightly, what does this have to do with demons? What is Roland planning to do? Roland coldly met his gaze. What awaited Timothy was the declaration of his crimes, a judgment, and then the execution. Just like Gerald. However, the difference was that Timothy's guilt was undeniable. Fear gripped Timothy, making his legs weak. He clutched the bars tightly and shouted, Roland can't kill him. A demon cannot stand in front of everyone, the power of the gods will destroy him. If Roland wants the kingdom, he needs Timothy's help. The church's power is far more powerful than Roland had ever imagined. Timothy only learned of this from their father's personal diary. Roland simply responded, he knows far more than Timothy. Roland also knows what the path ahead will look like. It's a perilous journey, and Timothy is not fit to lead the people. Roland spoke slowly, to prepare for the imminent challenges, Timothy's fate must end here. But worry not, his journey to hell won't be a lonely one. Many will accompany him. Having nothing more to say to Timothy, Roland handed him over to Hill before leaving. He stood up, ignoring Timothy's shouts and curses, and headed out of the dungeon. Upon seeing Timothy, Hill felt his heart tremble, not out of fear, but sheer excitement. It was an excitement he couldn't contain. He could finally exact his revenge. This man before him was the murderer of his wife. Hill introduced himself calmly, describing how he'd blended in among the rats and taverns, gathering information on Timothy's moves, then organizing and analyzing the intel to present to King Roland. Timothy, squinting with anger, shouted back, why is Hill telling him all this? He doesn't care about a traitor who betrayed his own king. He continued to yell, Roland is a demon. And Hill is serving a demon just for the sake of a woman? Hill's lips curled into a slight smile. When Hill pleaded to the gods and received no responses, he had made a vow if he could achieve his revenge, he would willingly follow even a demon into the depths of hell. Nightingale perched at the window, looking out at the city under the cloak of night. Wendy's voice interrupted her thoughts as she walked up to Nightingale, rubbing her shoulder. Wendy yawned, she has no idea where those two little girls get their energy from. After everything today, they're still clamoring for a bedtime story. Nightingale chuckled, if they weren't punished with three sets of exercises last time, she bet they'd be out on an adventure tonight, not asking for stories. The two looked back at the girls, Maisie was sprawled on lightning. Nightingale smiled, saying those two really do get along well, Wendy noted with a soft smile. She remembered Tilly mentioning how Maisie used to transform into a pigeon, perching on the beams to sleep, always alert to any noise, ready to escape danger in her transformed state. Now, she can finally sleep soundly, like a regular girl, Wendy paused, her voice tinted with emotion, looking at Nightingale, saying they had made the right choice. 
Nightingale didn't respond, but every witch from the border town would likely feel the same way. After a prolonged silence, Wendy asked, Do Nightingale want to go back and take a look? Nightingale was momentarily taken aback. Wendy pointed out the window in a specific direction, Silver City, Nightingale's home. With Maisie's speed, it wouldn't take very long and her brother is still there. Nightingale didn't expect Wendy to bring this up. She hesitated briefly before shaking her head, right now is a crucial time to stabilize the city's order. There are potential enemies everywhere, Nightingale won't leave his majesty's side. But after Grey Castle is pacified, there will be plenty of opportunities to visit Silver City. There's no rush. Hearing this, Wendy seemed reassured, sensing that Nightingale no longer held resentment towards her own younger brother. Nightingale smiled, saying that if it weren't for her younger brother's betrayal, she wouldn't have met Wendy, nor would she have met Roland. Remembering what Wendy had often told her, Nightingale now just hoped to live a more fulfilling life than before. Wendy chuckled, and Nightingale took her hand, assuring her she wouldn't sneak away, suggesting it was time to sleep. After a while, once Nightingale confirmed Wendy had fallen asleep, she gently climbed out of bed, disappearing into the mist, and heading towards Roland's room. And only during the night, Roland belonged to her alone. The next day, Roland met with his old friend, Margaret. Happily, he mentioned that meeting the nobles and ministers over the past few days didn't bring him as much joy as seeing Margaret. He reassured her that the place was very safe and there were no outsiders, asking if she had anything confidential to discuss with him. Margaret said she was entrusted by someone to relay a message to King Roland alone, Lord Thunder wishes to meet with Roland. Upon hearing this, Roland was greatly surprised, hadn't Lord Thunder, the most magnificent explorer of the fjord, already passed in a shipwreck? Margaret shook her head. Thunder didn't want to reveal his whereabouts, especially to Lightning, which is why she had to secretly inform Roland. Thunder mentioned that he had discovered an incredible sight to the west of the Shadow Isles, possibly related to the ancient ruins from hundreds of years ago. Roland would definitely be interested in it. Only then did Roland realize that Thunder was already in the capital. He looked at Margaret, and she didn't seem the least bit surprised by Thunder's return from the supposed dead. Had Margaret known about this all along? She nodded, saying the magical stone lightning war was used by Thunder to track her location. Margaret's first trip to Border Town was also to ensure Lightning's safety. Once Thunder realized that Lightning had settled in Roland's territory, he decided to keep his whereabouts a secret to deter his daughter from the path of an adventurer. Roland was a bit speechless, he had thought that his technology had attracted foreign investors. Margaret chuckled, mentioning her gratitude to Border Town for opening up new trade routes for her. Realizing the whole story, Roland assured her that he couldn't leave the palace right now. If Thunder wished to see him, Margaret could bring him to the palace any time, promising he wouldn't reveal anything to Lightning. Margaret expressed her gratitude and bowed, promising a swift reply. As she left, Roland's guards reported that a noble, claiming to be an old friend of King Roland, was causing a commotion outside, insisting on entering the palace. This news took Roland by surprise. He inquired about the name of the visitor, and the guards replied, his name is Sir York. Roland almost choked on his tea. Soon, a slightly chubby man with his signature upward curled blonde hair and fair skin entered. Roland had almost forgotten about this person, but upon hearing his name, memories flooded back. Sir York walked into the office, still exuding the air of a spoiled noble. Even knowing Roland had become the king, York greeted him with the same old, enthusiastic hug. York mentioned he wasn't like the other cowards who were afraid of Timothy. Roland nodded helplessly, looking at his old friend, the man with the title magic hand, who was once as close to him as a brother. Back when Roland felt isolated by his siblings and even got beaten up by Tilly. It was York who saved him, introducing him to the pleasures of high nobility and even having a bunch of younger followers at their command. While the morality of their actions might be questionable, the fourth prince had always considered York his best friend. Leaning on Roland's shoulder, York suggested they should go for a drink since he was back in town. 
Then, leaning into Roland's ear, he whispered, Did Roland want to see Lady Josephine or Miss Bird? After spending the night together, they seemed to miss Roland very much. Suddenly, a chilling sensation emanated from behind Roland, a cold gaze piercing through him, directed straight at York. York's voice halted, looking around confusedly, feeling the sudden drop in temperature. Roland quickly interjected, saying he never had any relations with them. In Roland's mind, even if there was any connection, it was with the fourth prince, not him. His denial was sincere, and he hoped Nightingale couldn't discern any lies as he was basically telling the truth since it was the old fourth prince who had done it, and not him. As expected, the chilly feeling lessened after his response. Touching his chin, York said, but Roland clearly spent a night with them, didn't he? Roland emphasized, nothing happened that night. York looked puzzled for a moment, but soon regained his initial grin, continuing to invite Roland to the best brothel in the capital. Roland waved his hand dismissively, saying he would only spend his nights in the palace now. He won't be going to those places anymore. Joining his hands together as if in prayer, he piously declared that he no longer had such worldly desires. York nodded in understanding. Ah, he gets it. With all the beautiful palace maids around, Roland must want to enjoy them first. He decided to share some of his unique skills with Roland to ensure that all the ladies would never forget him. Recalling the old times when Roland would always pester him to learn, he thought that now, as king, Roland would likely have even more lovers than he ever did. These skills would certainly come in handy. Roland quickly silenced York, almost reaching out to cover his mouth. He couldn't let York continue spilling their shared past, especially not with Nightingale potentially overhearing. It was like a complete expose of all his dark secrets. Roland emphasized, he is not the same person he used to be. York nodded, of course, Roland is the king now. Interrupting him, Roland grabbed York by the shoulder, questioning if he had a request for him? York grinned cheekily, could Roland perhaps give him a minister title, nothing high-ranking? just overseeing a patrol team would do. He promises to whip those rats and gangs into kittens. Roland inwardly rolled his eyes. Imagining York leading a patrol squad, flirting around, and directly instigating fights with other young noblemen was a terrifying thought. However, placing him in a suitable position might serve as good publicity, showing that anyone loyal could have a chance of promotion in this transition of power. Aside from York's inability to control his urges, he didn't have any significant vices. The key was to find a position suitable for someone like him. After pondering for a moment, Roland informed York that someone would notify him in a few days. With a cheerful expression, York departed from the office. No sooner had York stepped out than Nightingale materialized behind. Asking who are Lady Josephine and Miss Bird, her tone tinged with curiosity. And what's the signature technique York spoke about? That was indeed a challenging question to answer. Walking over to the window and feigning contemplation, Roland replied, just two women he chanced upon in the past. Nightingale interrupted, recalling York said they missed Roland very much. Roland with a serious tone said what they miss is not him but the prestige and wealth associated with being a prince. As for the signature technique, it's rather complicated and not worth mentioning. Besides, it's not something he would ever need or use. Nightingale stifled a giggle, covering her mouth with her hand. Roland said earnestly, he was curious back then, but he doesn't need those tricks anymore. He turned to look at Nightingale, who, for some reason, averted her gaze, a faint blush appearing on her cheeks. She nodded and said she believed Roland now. Roland felt a weight lift off his shoulders. He was relieved to have cleared up the misunderstanding with Nightingale. Now, his attention shifted to the explorer from the fjord, Thunder. Wrapped head to toe with only his eyes exposed, Thunder moved silently into the palace. Once inside, he removed his heavy cloak and scarf, offering a bow in respect. It's an honor to meet your majesty, Roland, Thunder continued and thanked Roland for taking care of Lightning. Roland smiled, responded, and he thanks Thunder for his care for Tilly. After she moved to the slumbering isle, 
She often mentioned the help she received from Thunder. Thunder then delved into the details of his astonishing discoveries, which left Roland dumbstruck. Water forming solid platforms, defying gravity? Thunder expressed his desire to have a steamship built, one that didn't rely on sails and was extremely fast. After taking a moment to process the information, Roland responded, This isn't about money. He will produce the ship for free and employ the best technology he has. Thunder looked slightly taken aback, but before he could voice his thoughts, Roland cut him off. This isn't just about Thunder's personal endeavor anymore. To explore the unknown, to uncover the world's mysteries holds as much significance as altering the destiny of mankind. Roland fully supports Thunder's explorations, and all Roland asks in return is that Thunder shares any new discoveries with him immediately. They further discussed logistics and plans. After the lengthy conversation, Thunder, once again enveloped in his cloak, took his leave. Reflecting on the groundbreaking discoveries Thunder had shared, Roland felt a deep, lingering sensation. It seemed the answers to the world's mysteries might be far more profound than he'd ever imagined. Nightingale, observing Roland's deep contemplation, approached with concern. What's troubling Roland? she inquired. Roland shook his head, exhaling a long breath. Just some unsettling feelings, he admitted. Roland asked Nightingale if she had ever heard of elves, creatures with pointed ears, similar in stature to humans but more graceful, agile, and can live a long life, usually dwelling within forests Nightingale shook her head in response. Roland mentioned that he had come across these fictional beings in a storybook. Once widespread across the continent, these creatures were gradually pushed into forests and more remote places due to the rise and dominance of humans. Despite their intelligence, the elves were outnumbered. Facing armies hundreds of times their size, they had little resistance. Trapped in secluded areas, they began to lag, both culturally and technologically, to the point where humans surpassed them. Eventually, these once mighty beings were reduced to mere pets. Nightingale slowly realized the parallels between the elves and their current situation. As a human, Roland had always overlooked this perspective. The chilling realization dawned upon him, in the present situation, it was humanity that was the minority, outnumbered and cornered to a small portion of the continent by the demonic forces. The vast world outside remained unknown to them. This revelation further solidified Roland's resolve to support Thunder's exploration. If they didn't broaden their perspective and actively learn about their position in the world, they might suffer the same fate as the elves in the story. Two divine wars had already consumed nearly a thousand years. Roland hoped this was not too late. A young girl watched Soraya work and excitedly commented that Soraya had finished drawing all the materials for so many bicycle inner tubes just in one morning. Jill, being among the first batch of graduates, had now become Soraya's assistant in the bicycle factory. The first batch of bicycles would soon be completed, and as workers of the factory, they would receive the first batch of benefits. Jill happily mentioned that she would soon have her own bicycle. After finishing her work, Soraya left the factory. A morning's work had consumed a third of her magic power. Reflecting back to a year ago, she realized that such an amount of work would have completely exhausted her. But she was delighted now, recognizing that training genuinely enhanced her abilities. Soraya rode her bicycle towards the backyard of the North Slope mine. Both Lucia and Anna, hearing her footsteps, looked up and greeted her with radiant smiles. They waved to her, and Lily and Rem also came holding afternoon tea and a deck of cards. Time always flies when playing cards, the afternoon passed in the blink of an eye. After dinner, Scroll announced some unexpected news. That night's lesson was cancelled and replaced by an echo ability test. The only non-witch in the hall, Ling, raised her hand to ask how they should proceed. Scroll smiled and replied that all they had to do was listen intently. Agatha stood up, saying if there was no lesson, she'd go back to her room. Scroll shook her head, explaining that the reason for this test was because of Agatha. Everyone's gazes turned to Agatha, including Soraya's, and were fixed on her. 
Seeing the dark circles under her eyes, Scroll commented that Agatha was pushing herself too hard, consuming her magical power to its limit every day, which the body couldn't withstand. Agatha retorted that in Takira, high-ranking witches always did this. People hadn't realized the brutality of the Divine War. Unless one side was utterly defeated, it wouldn't cease. If, 400 years ago, the Federation could find a path that might lead to victory, she believed they'd be willing to sacrifice everything, even if it meant sacrificing their lives. Scroll spoke softly, but His Highness also said that pushing oneself relentlessly can lead to decreased efficiency. A balance between work and rest is the best approach, be it in studying or working. Scroll has conveyed Agatha's situation to Roland, and this test is an attempt at addressing it. They aim to test the revitalizing ability of Echo. Everyone was surprised and thought the Echo could heal the injured just like Nanoa. Scroll shook her head, saying she didn't know anything about it and clarifying that it was the prince's idea. Echo seemed a bit nervous as everyone instinctively held their breath, waiting for her to showcase her ability. Gentle music began to play, echoing like a serene spring in everyone's ears. For a moment, Soraya felt as if everything around her had transformed. It was as if she was enveloped in a warm spring. All the witches felt the same, their bodies completely relaxed, basking in the incredibly soothing sensation of the spring water. When the singing ended, it took Soraya a long time to slowly open her eyes. Without anyone explaining, she understood the meaning of the word revival as Scroll had described. Her inner magic hadn't increased, but the day's fatigue seemed to have vanished. She felt rejuvenated as if she had awoken from a deep slumber.